All right, uh, welcome to another episode of Friday Live. I'm Stephen Pulver, and I'm the managing editor here at Hodinkee. Uh, and I'm here with author, watch nerd, friend of the show, uh, <laughs> Gary Steingart. Um, so welcome. Thank you Thanks. so much for joining us. So great to be here. Wow. <laughs> uh, for some of you, in case you don't know who Gary is, Gary is an author and writer. Uh, he's the author of five books, uh, New York Times bestsellers, uh, books like Super Sad True Love Story, Absurdistan, um, and a handful of others, one of which we're going to talk about a little bit, uh -huh. uh, a little bit later. Um, but Gary's also a watch nut of some, of some note now. Oof, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and so you're kind of like entree into the watch world, or you're, you're coming out in the watch world, uh, <laughs> yeah. was a story uh, <laughs> they read in The New Yorker uh, back in March, which mm -hmm. feels like forever ago now. I know, it does. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this story and like how you came to want to write uh, how many thousands of words story? Well, it was a lot. I think it yeah. was like 4,000 words, if I'm okay. not mistaken. It was a lot of words yeah. uh, about watches. How did you convince The New Yorker <laughs> to let you write a 4,000 word story about watches? Well, I, was, I, I did a podcast uh, with David Remnick, who's the editor of The New Yorker, yeah. and we did a podcast. He does this great podcast about three cultural things you're obsessed with at the time. And so my things were <laughs> Ice Cube, uh, the show Bojack Horseman, and Hodinkee. And he'd never heard of Hodinkee, uh, and I was wearing actually the same watch I'm wearing today. And he's, you know, we started talking about it, and he realized that I was not just talking a little bit about watches, but I was going on for about 20 minutes, kind of, you know, not gauging his interest, being like, eh, watch, watch, watch. And he said, maybe you should write a piece about uh, watches. Uh, and, I, and I said, yes, thank you, uh, because I thought now I can really research this stuff and go to some of my favorite places like uh, Glashütte in Germany, yeah. makers of Lange and Nomos, and some of my favorite brands. So I jumped on it right away, and I spent a lot of time researching this yeah, article. Sure. <laughs> 4,000 word articles don't just like come off the top of your head. But it was pure pleasure. Sometimes you're doing an article, and you're like, oh, God, I have to go here, I have to go there. But all the watch nerds I met were so sweet. Uh, uh, we're a nice bunch. Really nice yeah. group of people. The Orological Society, the Red Bar, every place I went, you know, you could just hang around and talk about micro rotors for an hour and nobody would judge you. That's a very small group of people. It's a small though. group yeah, of people, but I'm so glad they, they, they exist. You know? Good. How, how did you kind of get roped into watches? Because you're like a rel relatively new to this, to this world, right? I am, uh, this is my second year, so I'm okay. a sophomore at uh, right. Horological U. All right. um, how it happened was I went to, uh, I went to the MoMA uh, to okay. the design store to uh, buy uh, some Bauhaus tea kettle or whatever the heck one gets. And, there and I stopped by the watch counter and I saw a young Hans Max bill okay. and I thought, wow, this is actually, see in my mind as in the mind of many civilians who aren't aware of watches, it's either a Casio G-Shock or a Rolex Daydate in yellow yeah. gold. Those are the two sort of archetypes. But seeing something that was very mid-century, uh, very minimalist, very accessible, very Bauhaus influenced, I thought, oh, I can't believe watches are actually like that too. So I was... I bought one. I didn't even know what an automatic watch was. Mm -hmm. We ended up calling Young Hans America, being like, well, this watch doesn't work. You know, <laughs> it, it, it runs out of battery after two days of, of me not wearing it. You know, That's a classic problem. Classic problem. So just to give you the, after realizing the weight of my own ignorance, I started to read uh, everything I could get my hands on. Uh, Hodinkee, obviously, being the primary source. Uh, and also, the election was happening. Okay. And I was being freaked out by everything that was going on. Uh, so, I think he was sort of my refuge from reading 538, all those political sites. Yeah. I was like, okay, this actually calms me down and gives yeah. me some hope that. We do a slightly you know, different kind of reporting here. Yeah. <laughs> 538. Thank God that yeah. that's the case. So, that was sort of. So, after that, I became obsessed with Nomos. Um, again, sticking to that kind of Bauhausian mid century aesthetic. So, I got a Nomos. Then I started plunging into Rolexes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and now I'm on the hunt, a desperate hunt for a 1675 GMT. This is like a PSA, help me uh, <laughs> get one in, in guilt. Um, so that's, so it's been a, a fun journey and I, I fear, and my wife fears that it's only the beginning. Right? Yeah, it, I can promise you it's only okay, the beginning. Great, uh, great. It's gonna get way, way worse and way better, okay. uh, depending on <laughs> yeah. whether you ask yourself or your bank account. Um, Does my kid need to go to college? I don't know. <sighs> Rolexes are really nice. Yeah, they're really, yeah, they're really nice. Um, yeah, what was the process of researching this story like? Like you mentioned going to the HSMY mm -hmm. meetings, going mm -hmm. to Red Bar, reading Hodinkee. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you, when you realize this whole universe exists in front of you, like how do you attempt to get into it and understand it? Well, there, you can do it a couple of ways. So I do a, a lot of what I write is, is based on the sort of personal essay model. Now, mm -hmm. what a real journalist would do would be very different. Uh, a real journalist would probably fly immediately to Geneva and, and various other, see all the manufacturers, uh, talk about the, 
you know, where watches are going, the, the fear of um, uh, the Apple III watch, or it was the Apple II at that point taking over. But that's not, I write, you know, novels and memoirs, mostly so my essays mm -hmm. are very personal. So I wanted to frame it like one person's obsession. Okay. Uh, how does my obsession grow? Uh, and then it became kind of personal because the people I met, you know, I met all the Hodinkee people and, and all the people. And, and, and all the stories I ran into were very fascinating. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you'd go out and you'd, you'd, you'd go to Ben's house and you'd see some insane watch collection and he would talk about which, what each watch meant to him personally. Or you'd have a gluten-free martini with Jack and he would try to, you know, uh, contextualize the collector's gene in a way that mm. you've never heard before. So for me, all this stuff was very new and, and everyone was very welcoming. Uh, often when you're researching something, people will be very standoffish. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing a project on hedge funds, for example. People are not as, as friendly. It's a little different, yeah. Uh, nobody wants to reveal their secret sauce, stuff like that. Whereas in, in watch nerdery, it's just, you know, hey, yeah. thank God you're one of us. One more, you yeah. know. Yeah, and then you actually, you actually like got on a plane and went to Glashuta, yeah. uh, which yeah. is... You know, Geneva is, is generally considered the mecca of, of watchmaking, but I think Glashuta kind of strangely the small town in the mountains of uh, Germany. It's the weirdest town ever. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like the, you know, if German Twin Peaks were being filmed, they, they would probably <laughs> set it in Glashuta. I mean, it's bananas. There's nothing there. There's not even a donut to be found. Right. There's a guy that comes in with a chicken truck and he'll sell chickens to East German pensioners, you know, and that's pretty much the whole town. And watches and watchmaking. Uh, but I thought they were, they were incredible people. Uh, Nomo is of course a brand I love, yeah. Alanga as well. Uh, so going around and seeing the way those two watches are made was, for a junior watch geek, was yeah. just exceptional fun. Um, really, really interesting. And then going to Berlin, where Nomos has their design studio, mm -hmm. and, and in Kreuzberg, the hippest part of Berlin. Well, not anymore, but two years ago. It changes every month. <laughs> uh, but still a very cool part of Berlin, where I actually used to live. I used to live in Berlin for a year. Um, so, just meeting those people and, and seeing also how they market their watches is very mm -hmm. interesting. Those guys are full on. They'll, they'll publish like a 500 page encyclopedia, the Nomos Encyclopedia, which yeah. is just this very dry German humor, um, brilliantly translated, really great stuff. So, very impressed with, uh, it wasn't just a watch, it seemed to be more like a, a grander idea than just mm -hmm. watchmaking. Is there something about German watches versus Swiss watches that just like speaks to you more? Because you seem to be, while, while, you know, as we'll talk about in a little bit, Rolex and Tudor factor in and yeah. some older Swiss brands, German watches seem to be kind of a, a, a thing for you. I mean, I have to say personally, and no offense to others, I just think they're incredibly well made these days mm -hmm. and incredibly well priced. Mm -hmm. um, I think partly this can be explained by the fact that in this Twin Peaks-like village, labor costs are probably cheaper than in Switzerland, which obviously has one of the highest labor costs anywhere. But they seem to be designed with more intelligence right now. Mm -hmm. Right now, another watch brand I love is Grand Seiko, mm -hmm. which obviously takes us across the Pacific. Um, for vintage watches, of course, uh, you know Rolex and Tudor and Universal are probably yeah. my three favorite brands. Patek, the mid-century Calatravas are possibly the best watches ever made. But in terms of watches that exist now. Um, I, I mean, Tudor is another interest of mine, and that's obviously Switzerland, but I am, I would say, more... When you guys go to Basel World, it's the, when you report from, the, from Nomos or, or Grand Seiko, that's the stuff that I want to see first okay. when your feet appears. So. We'll make sure to uh, hit those hard this year. Oh, yeah, or take me yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. That's an option. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can make that happen. I travel well. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> compact. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I think, you know, the New Yorker story was your first big written piece about, about watches, but then as some people might know, um, the Hodinkee magazine started delivering to customers this week, which was pretty exciting, and uh, we're all, all very excited about that. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who have gotten your copy and have read through it, uh, you'll notice the, the closing thoughts at the back are from Mr. Steingart. Um, so if we can pick, pick back up uh -huh. uh, with where you left off with your search for a uh, 1675. Yeah, um, it's one of the watches that I really have always wanted. I think it's just beautiful and functional. And um, uh, so I, was, I came to Odinki where I there, think there's like a whole like five 1675s running around. I think, yeah, I think there's five of them around so, the office, yeah. And I, I, before I was too timid to try one on, I thought, what if, it's my perfect watch, what if it doesn't fit? Yeah. How am it's I going to live? Slipper. How am I going to? Yes, yeah, my glass slipper. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I tried it on here, and the um, the thickness of it, mm. combined with the diameter, for some reason works. Usually forty. Yeah. And I, I was just so happy. Um, so the article sort of is about this search for this elusive item, mm. um, and I know it fits now. Now the only problem is finding one that um, that is that's 
That's where the real challenge That's is. That's the real challenge. Yeah. So I've, been, yeah. I've been hunting for a couple of months now, but the yeah. hunt goes on. How, how have you been hunting? So my strategy for hunting watches is very simple. I, I call Eric Wind. Okay. Uh, Not a bad place to start. <laughs> formerly of Hodinkee and, and, and of Christie's. Uh, mm -hmm. And he just told me I can announce that he uh, is starting his own uh, company. Uh, okay. Uh, Wind Vintage, right, I think it's mm -hmm. called. Um, Not Wind and Zona. Uh, I, I told him you should call it Wind and Zona, yeah. like longer, but he decided to do something sensible. <laughs> um, so Wind Vintage. Uh, so I let him know what I'm looking for, or I find something and I check with him. I mean, look again, being fairly new to this, I mm -hmm. know that I, I would. I'm already developing a, an idea of what can be fake and what can be frank and watchy, yeah. but I still always want to check with somebody who's done this for for, sure. for years, you know. And, and I'm lucky enough to be able to pester the Hodinky crew <laughs> or. or or other people that I've met. Uh, I think most school. most of us still run things by other yeah. people. It's always good to get get yeah. another another set of eyes on something, oh. another perspective. Oh. Yeah, no, it's it's very important. Um, and then you, you you know you do all these trade offs. You want to buy the best watch that you can for what you can afford. But um, for example, I, I always think the dial is the most important. But people are telling me about a 1675 that's got um, an amazing pointed crown guard, unpolished case. You know, just beautiful stuff. But the dial has lost its glossiness. So what would Jesus do? You know, what, right. what do you do in a situation like this? You know, uh, a case is so important. At the same time, the dial may be the most important yeah. thing. So I think you hold out for something with a good dial. I think you hold out. They're out there. We, can, out there. Uh, yeah. we can help you a little okay, bit. Okay, right. Help you find one. Well, this is great. Yeah, this calling, is... calling all people with glossy uh, guilt. Please. 1675s. Help me. Gary's, Gary's looking. I'm desperately looking, desperately searching Gary. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the process. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had looking for these watches. I mean, we enjoy the search, I think, as yeah. much as the we The search enjoy. is a part of the pleasure. Yeah, you know, it, if, you, it, if the watch falls into your lap, it's not nearly as fun as if you've yes. spent six months laboring for it. Which is why vintage, I think, makes so much sense for so many people. Yeah. It's, it's a, you know, you can walk in now and buy a beautiful Saxonia 37 millimeter thin, and yeah. you've done it, and you walk right. out, and it's over. And right. It's nice, but... Yeah, I mean, I think you jumped into vintage faster than a lot of people. I mean, a lot of collectors, you know, I talk to, you know, they do the, the modern thing. They first, they buy a watch at a boutique or a, a multi-brand retailer like a Torno or a London or someplace like that. Uh, and over time, you know, they try a few brands. Eventually, maybe they try something that's like pre-owned mm, and then pre -owned. slowly they get into vintage. Mm -hmm. uh, and it takes, you know, three, five, seven, ten years for them to like really feel comfortable in vintage. Yeah. What made you feel comfortable kind of like dipping into vintage watches so so quickly? I think as a novelist and as a memoirist, I've written about, you know, my own childhood. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I think of the 70s, the 80s or, or, or before that, there's something very appealing about that. Um, I know there's this whole controversy around Fotina, for example. You mm -hmm. know? Do you want and, and the question really boils down to do you want to build your own story? Or do you want to buy someone else's story and yeah. then make it your own? Um, and I love both approaches. Uh, I love owning something from the start and then... Yeah. But I, you know, one of my favorite watches that I recently bought, which is of course in the shop because it's from 1945, uh, Universal Tri Compacts. Um, mm -hmm. Those watches love to be in the shop. They're like they shop-loving watches. Um, and, you know, I thought, my God, you know, this watch could have been around for the Yalta conference yeah. or, or, or the Potsdam conference in which... Um, uh, Truman wore an actual tri compact, not the one I own, but you know, having that kind of connection is 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 just for a person with any kind of sentimental uh, reflex, yeah. that's just wonderful. Completely. So um, both have their. I love starting a, buying a new watch and then seeing it develop, but also I love uh, to dip into history. Great. Yeah, let's let's use that then as a way to kind of segue into uh, your collection. So. You brought a handful of watches here today. Not not everything, but uh, and not that tricompax that's getting fixed up. Hopefully, it'll be back home oh, soon. I miss it so much. Come back, <laughs> tricompax. Come back. Um, yeah. So let's start. Let's start with the Nomos. Let's so, start with the watch yeah, that kind of yeah. started it all. So this watch did kind of start it all. It was the second watch I bought after the, the Max Bill. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I love this. It's um, it's a minimatic. Uh, it's the first edition, so it has a kind of orange circle around the dial. They later thought maybe there was too much orange going on, and they, okay. they tamed it. Now, what I love, I love watches that are, can't be easily identified as being, you know, having masculine or feminine properties. I mm -hmm. love a more kind of uni, um, you know, unisex kind of watch, mm -hmm. and that's a, a big specialty of Nomos. There's a lot of vintage watches that also fall into that category. You guys have talked about uh, the day date and the date yeah. just and stuff like that. Uh, so this is a 35.5 millimeter case. Now it came on this strap, uh, which 
was um, vegetable dyed leather, I believe. Okay. And it started was started out almost like a like peach color, right? Peach like colored, a, almost a little bit flesh tone. Yeah. I thought that was fun, but this is where you go a little bit crazy. I started tanning my own straps. You're tanning your own straps. I'm tanning my own straps. I got a couple. This is All right. The, so you really, you're really off the, in the deep end. This here. is the deep end. So I live half the year in the country, so I'll. Uh, <laughs> I'll take the straps out in the morning and I'll put them on the on my porch and I'll let the morning mist roll in and they kind of soften them up a little bit, right? Yeah. And then I'll take them and I'll put them by the pool where the sun shines the most. Okay. And it'll just fry them after they've already been sort of moisturized. Um, okay. And the result, I think, is really... I showed this I to... I mean, it looks amazing. I showed this to Uwe, uh, Uwe, the... the, yeah. the, the, the the head of uh, Nomos, and he was, he was like, this is so wabi-sabi, he said, you know. Uh, it's uh, something. It's something, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a... <sighs> so That's awesome. When you're a novelist, you have a lot of time on your hands, too. Okay. So you're either getting drunk or you're tanning, you know, or you're both. tanning your straps or both. both. Yeah, probably <laughs> Having both. martini hour yeah. with, you know. That's incredible. I've actually never heard of somebody else doing that. that yes, thanks. That makes me feel great. Uh, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so that's so, cool. That's cool. Uh, and you said you're working on multiple ones at a, at a time. Yeah, there's two being there's two in the process. Okay. One has probably gone through the mist procedure okay. and is now ready for the sun. Okay. And the other's already in the sun. And that way, when this one wears out, you'll. When have this one wears that. out, I'll have yeah, yeah. and I'll order that's more cool. from Nomos. Honestly, it looks it looks incredible. Thank now. you. I, 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 and when people see this, they, they don't know what kind of um, they're like. Which model is that? Even people who know Nomos well, mm. because the, the the contrast between the strap and the yeah. dial is very. Yeah, I mean different. the strap starts out almost the same color as the dial. It's, it's dial. extremely exactly. light. Exactly. But I have to say, Nomos is like it's such a schmuck-proof brand. You know, when you yeah. meet when you meet someone wearing a Nomos, yeah, they're usually okay people, and you can't yeah, say I'll, that for other brands. I'll, yeah, I'll, there you go. I'll, I'll take you know? that. Yeah. I was having lunch with a TV producer I've admired all my life, and um, I was I didn't know what he was going to be like. We mm. walk into the restaurant. He's wearing a Nomos. I'm wearing a Nomos. You're good. We're good. You know, yeah. it's not got many problems. Are we going to see any TV series about Nomos anytime soon? Oh, we kind of talked about. It. We we're like, should we do a TV series on Watch Nerds? And then we're like, yeah, yes. <laughs> let's think about that. One. Okay. <laughs> so where did you go from the Nomos? So from the Nomos, I mean, all my life I've I've had mixed feelings about Rolex. Um, it was one of those big brands growing up, like BMW. That mm -hmm. if you grew up in the '80s, you, you know. You'd, you didn't exactly hear great things about them. Yeah. They belong to a certain group of people um, with a certain wide ties and stuff like that. But um, once you own a Rolex, you start to realize quite quickly, it's a really great watch. Yeah. You know, and, it's tough and to argue with. It's really tough to argue. So the, the one I bought was a very simple Air King. Uh, this was, I think, my first vintage watch. And what I loved about it was really the dial, the blue jean dial. Mm -hmm. and, and you put on a nice uh, Harween leather strap, yeah. you know. Um, now, purists will say, okay, there's a lot of problems with this watch, too. The lugs have been uh, polished to near yeah. death. But, you know, I, I People think... People can always find something to argue with. Yeah, yeah. and this watch, I love wearing it to... I, I, research often takes me to somewhat more dangerous places. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever knows what this is. It looks like a, you right. know, like a swatch from a certain angle. So right. it's, it's, it's a really a, a fun watch. And this is really as small as it gets for me, 34 millimeters. Okay. Below, as much as I'd love to own, like, a Paddock 96 or something, mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen. Uh, and the final watch, or penultimate watch, I brought today is um, a Tudor 36 that I'm wearing on a nice Hodinkee strap here. Hey. Um, and what I use this watch for is, uh, so I, the only activity I do is I swim about two hours a day. Because um, I eat a lot and I need to burn all that stuff. So I actually need to wear a watch in the water. I know Kara may not approve, but... Um, Kara, who is sitting right over right there. there yeah. right proof. Also showering with a watch, I know, is, no, is a no-go territory. But I, since I swim so much, I actually need to know the time in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, so watches like this, um, Nomos it, actually came out with a great one. The Club Minimatique mm -hmm. is, is wonderful. I may get that next. Um, is really useful. And just the design, it's it, it sort of, when I first saw this, it, it reminded me so much of, of an Explorer 1016. Yeah, which totally. Is, I think this is the closest watches. thing you can buy today yeah. to a 1016. Can you imagine that yeah. you know, Tudor does this? You, it's waterproof. It's just, it, it's relatively speaking, not expensive. It's mm -hmm. uh, Tudor is, is, I think, the Swiss brand that I feel closest to these okay. days, uh, one I really, really love. Great. Yeah. So there's a couple of watches. And cool. Yeah. So we solicited some questions because we knew people would want to ask you things and not just have me uh, blather on about whatever I want to talk about. Um, so let's start with a question that actually ties in this last uh -huh, watch uh -huh. we have here. So uh, M. Papier uh, asked, 
if you could share some insights about family heirlooms and watches, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which you did not know was going to be asked, but you brought this anyway. I so. Brought, yeah. so this watch, so I was born in Leningrad in the USSR, and my parents are also from the Soviet Union. Uh, so I, after I published that article in The New Yorker, my mom said, oh, I had no idea you liked watches. Uh, which I didn't classic know. Mom. Classic, classic mom. Classic mom. Uh, she said, you know that one of the first gifts, major gifts that I gave to your dad was a watch. Uh, this is before I was born. Uh, and it was a Soviet watch, a palyot. So a, a lot of Soviet watches have na or aeronautical names. Mm -hmm. Palyot means flight. Raketa obviously is rocket. Um, the famous watch Yuri Gagarin wore in space, sort of the, the Soviet moon watch or space watch was uh, Sturmansky, which means navigator in Russian. So they all had these kinds of names. So this is a Palyot watch. It's gold plated. It's already flaking. It doesn't really work. But um, it's, everything's written in English here. So it mm -hmm. was a watch meant for export. Okay. So those were very expensive watches. So my mom says, she remembers the price. It was 140 rubles. And the average engineer earned 120 rubles a month. So this was a very important gift. So I like to think that maybe I wouldn't have been born without this watch, but I, I doubt that connection could be made. We but should probably get it working again. We, I, I definitely yeah. want to get it working, but it, that would be nice to explain my obsession with watches by saying, hey, yeah. this is an existential question for me. I, <laughs> this watch made it all happen. But, and I kind of, I think Soviet watches have a kind of utilitarian beauty. They're, yeah. they're, and they're not bad movements either. They, they stole all the technology from Germany, from right. places like Lange after the war. Um, Stalin was huge into watch production. He, and remember back then, if you were late for work, mm -hmm. you could be sent to a labor camp. So having an accurate watch was actually a, an important thing to have. Yeah. You know. oh, stakes are a little higher. Stakes there. were really high. Yeah. yeah so. Luckily, the stakes are not quite that high here at uh, Houdinki headquarters. Right, yeah. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So anyway, this is uh, this I think is, is is really quite an heirloom, and I, I want to get it working again. And my kid, he's only three years old, but he's also obsessed with watches at, oh, at three. Cool. So um, I, I think maybe this this Rolex would be a fine when he, his wrist hopefully will exceed mine in dimension. <laughs> uh, maybe he'll wear that soon enough. Great, cool. Well, let's dig in. We have a couple more questions that were asked in the comments uh, from yesterday. Uh, and then we're going to get into some live questions. Uh, so that's a reminder. Uh, if you're watching right now, leave us questions in the comments, either on YouTube or on the website. Uh, and we'll spend a few minutes here answering them. So DJ80 uh, asked in the comments yesterday, uh, a pretty, pretty standard question here. What is your Grail watch? So I have two Grail watches that I can actually buy. And I'm looking for, the, I think, the 1675 and 1016. Explorers in gilt. I love gilt because it brings up that kind of vintage yeah. feel. Um, I mean, again, I, I'm from the Bauhaus school of, you know, form follows function. Um, I love those watches. I think they're about as good and as functional as two watches can get. From the Grail, I will never buy. I would say the, the Patek 570, okay. two-tone Breguet numerals, the Paramico ones. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. In steel, or even I would even go for rose gold on that. On that you easy. would take the pink on pink. I would take the pink on okay. pink. You know, that, on that simple um, watches, I will never afford. But watches that I think, in, to my eye, are, are maybe the most beautiful watches I've ever seen. Okay, great. And it's that era you said of of Kala Travis, that mid-century, like 50s, 60s. Uh, I, I can just tell from your reaction. That's yeah. is that your kind of favorite era of, it's, of watch production? It was so good. And now you know you see Longines, for example, doing the Ben watch except adding a couple of millimeters to it. But, you know, thank you for doing that. Um, but, you know, um, you could tell that this was a golden period in, in yeah. watchmaking. Um, but there's some watches that are, that are there's some color travels that I love that, are, that I can't afford, like the, the 3445, which, mm -hmm. you know, date window alert, has a date window. Uh, but I think somehow it's just so elegant. The movement yeah. is exemplary. It's the first automatic and date mm -hmm. movement, I think, made in series for that for that watch, uh, the sunburst dial. I just think it's lovely and yeah. somewhat undervalued, I think, at this point. Cool. Um, so this is an interesting one. Uh, Jorn1304 asks, if there are any instances of watches impacting your writing outside of the stories you've written explicitly about watches? Yes, so I can announce for the first time on Hodinki that my next book, which will be out early next summer, it's a novel. Uh, it's about a hedge fund manager who loses his mind, but watches play a huge part in the story. In fact, they're referenced left and right. A Patek 570 comes in. The Universal Tri-Compacts is a huge part of the book. Um, and F.P. Jorn plays a role. Uh, I mean, and it's interesting, when I s submitted the manuscript to my editor at Random House, uh, 
I said, I hope, you know, it's okay. That it may bore you and some readers, but there's a lot of stuff about watches. And she actually uh, finished the book and she said, no, I love the, I love the okay. watches. Uh, and, and they all are conscripted to a kind of emotional effect. Okay. Because this guy can't really, re you know, he can't interact with people or he misinteracts with people. He doesn't know how to be a father, doesn't know how to be a husband. But the one thing he knows is watches. And this allows him to almost reach out to the world. This okay. may resonate with some readers, maybe not. Um, but he uses watches to reach out to the world. And, uh, um, and it has a, there's a bit of a Hodinkee connection in that uh, Ben lent me um, a tricompax before I bought, bought my own tricompax uh, that I used as a kind of reference. Uh, and then Jack Forrester proofed the, um, the uh, galleys to make sure there were no orological bloopers. Uh, Great. So, so it's Hodinkee co-signed uh, through and through. They're in the acknowledgments. Yeah, yeah, perfect. yeah, yeah. we can Love co-brand this uh, Random House Hodinkee <laughs> production. But, uh, but it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun to, um, to write. Um, and, you know, I think, and, and after reading it, some people at, at the publishing house and others said, hey, uh, talk to me about watches. Uh, so hopefully this will we'll, uh, expand our ranks a little bit more. Add some converts. Yeah. Great. Nice. Um, Another connection to your, to your writing, but to your previous writing, um, Blau would like to know what watches you would have your former protagonists wear. <laughs> yes, I, I think that he wrote a, a bit longer piece about, there were two characters that he was interested in, I believe. Uh, one is from my last novel, Super Sad True Love Story. He's a character named Lenny Abramov. Uh, and he's like a small furry immigrant type like myself, you know, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> Um, this, the book is set in the, f in the near future where all mechanical, there's no books left, mechanical objects don't really exist, everything is digital. And I wrote this before getting into watches, but you know, he was, um, he asked the main character, Lenny Abramov, what kind of watch would he wear? And he suggested a young Hans Max Bill. Um, and I think that's a pretty decent choice, but because Lenny is so pedantic about his love of arts and literature, I could see him wearing a Cartier tank. Um, and saying, you know, and then going on some rant about, you know, Warhol wore one of these, but he never wound it, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so I could see him wearing that. And then I had another character who was a 400-pound protagonist, son of one of the R Russia's richest oligarchs, uh, and he wondered if he would buy an Invicta. And I think that's an interesting choice, but I, I, I think the oligarch choice in Russia is more uh, Ulysse Nardan, I would say, maybe Breguet. Okay. So a giant UN okay. uh, would probably do the trick for him. Okay, great. Well, cool. Well, let's dig in. We have a couple minutes left here. Let's, uh, let's dig into some of these questions. Um, Noah wants to know, Gary, if you could only collect a single brand mm. and it wasn't Rolex, what would it be? It's a tough question. I mean, people are really honestly talking about the collectability of Nomos right now. I mean, it's a 20-year-old brand, but I think another person in the comment section was talking about, you know, 20 years from now, is this going to be a thing where there'll be a... a a mono collection, a mono brand collection of Nomos. They're, they're, with each year, they bring out stuff that's just different enough to make it interesting, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, I think that's a possibility. Um, otherwise, other than Rolex, I could see, I mean, there's some brilliant Omega, Calatravas and stuff, mm -hmm. and, and Kronos too. The 33, Cal 33, is that mm -hmm. the, uh, beautiful, gorgeous stuff. I mean, I could see 10 watches like that lined up and just being beautiful. Uh, Universal. Universal did so many iterations of the tri compacts and the unicompacts and aero compacts. I mean, it's like, you know, if you were a, a Welsh pig farmer, you'd have a compact, some <laughs> kind of pig compacts for you. I mean, they, they, just, they just did everything, you know, and, and it, was, it was great. We um, should make a pig compact. A pig compact would be great. <laughs> and, and the nice thing about Universal is that they're defunct, so they can't embarrass right. themselves anymore, right. you know, so they're gone. It's great. <laughs> So Gary, this plays into the conversation we had about your search for, for 1675. Mm. So Rippy uh, would like to know that when searching for a vintage watch, do you only make a purchase when you find the watch in your ideal condition? Or will you settle for less than ideal because you've been able to find something after a long search? How, how kind of particular are you? You know, I'm very flexible, actually. So when I started out looking for the tricompex, right, I, was, I thought, all right, I'm, I'm going to go for steel. Obviously, because everyone knows that the UG tricompax in steel is, is, is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the mentality. But then I saw a yellow gold case, which so many people now are like, oh, God, that's for, that's for my grandpa, you know, <laughs> and although I'm, I have many years on me too. Um, you know, so, and then I saw a universal tricompax in yellow gold with, with a creamy dial that went mm -hmm. so beautifully with the yellow gold and these Art Deco numerals. Yeah. And this was in some ways the opposite of what I was looking for, but the heart wants what it wants, and I just thought, this is it. 
this is the watch that, and that watch ended up inspiring the book quite a bit mm -hmm. because that is the watch that, that my main character owns. And, and something about, I just kept thinking, my God, this watch, it was one of the earliest, earliest iterations of, of Tri-Compaxes. And I thought, I'm not getting exactly what I set out to get, but maybe mm -hmm. I'm beating myself at my own game. You yeah. Know, getting something so it's less expected. about compromising on quality and more about just being flexible and like discovering new things in the search. Give me an interesting narrative that I didn't expect, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm down with it. Okay. You know? uh, but at the same time, there's certain things I really, really like the guilt aspect of the, of the dials on the 1675 and, yeah. and, and uh, 1016. That's something I don't want to compromise yeah. on. I think you have to wait for a glossy dial. Yeah, I will. Wanna, I will. You don't want to. I will. I will wait for a glossy dial. Um, I mean, we're lucky. We, I, I actually don't have like a, a list of 100 watches I want, mm -hmm. so I can focus on the ones I want to a great degree. Great. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I think that is going to be a wrap for this week. Thank you very much Thank for joining so much, us. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll have you back again soon. Anytime. Perfect. Uh, enjoy the weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next week for another iteration of Friday Live. Cool.